that. Um, as you can see on the slide, my name is uh, Kevin Klein, and uh, there's my contact information, uh, email, Twitter, for example, uh, LinkedIn. I'd love to connect with you if you have any questions or want some follow-up. Um, also, if you're not currently active on Twitter, um, you're actually missing out if you are a SQL Server person. Our community is very, very active online. And um, the, the trick to being productive on Twitter is not to use the Twitter UI. Don't go to twitter.com. Go to something called tweetdeck.twitter.com. And this allows you to create all kinds of different channels. Uh, so you can have your regular, what would be your regular Twitter stream, and then you could have a channel that says SQL family. That's a real common um, hashtag that uh, us SQL community people use. There's another one called SQL help. So just as you had the option, uh, Andrea, open the floor to any kind of questions, that's 24 by 7 nonstop in the Twitter space. And there are MVPs around following the sun around the earth, you know, uh, Australians in the, in the different, uh, entirely different time zone who will answer your questions late at night. And, you know, Americans here in the morning and, and so forth. So do get on Twitter, even if uh, you're not normally into it, because you can pop out there and ask questions and get great quality answers, typically within a few minutes. So uh, allow me the obligatory commercial for Century One, if you don't mind. If you haven't heard of Century One, um, we kind of mark it as the best of breed in the monitoring, optimization, and alerting space. And um, over in the lower left corner of the slide, you know, it talks about our expertise. And the thing, though, that's really re remarkable about our expertise is that we're all dedicated SQL Server people. We really care a lot about SQL Server. And that drives our motivation to make the products as good as they can be. Uh, for example, in our monitoring products, they cover more kinds of things that's in the Microsoft Data Platform than anyone else in the market. They go deeper and give you more granularity. And they do it with lower overhead than anyone else. So, you know, we're real propeller heads when it comes to SQL Server. The thing I'm most proud about, though, is in the lower right-hand corner, uh, describing what Cent Century One is like. And that is, we, uh, the core team was all DBAs at one time. And it's been a, a part of our kind of DNA that we support our users the way we wanted to be supported and weren't by uh, other vendors back when we were in the same jobs you are. And so by almost every metric that you can think of, measuring customer satisfaction in the software industry, we're actually in the top 1%, not just of SQL tools, not just of monitoring tools, in the entire software industry. So I'm really proud of that. Now, what do we make? We make a ton of products, actually. Um, monitoring uh, across the board for all, all things SQL related, so all of the data warehousing, all of the analysis services, in, um, integration services, of course, the relational engine, both on in the cloud and on premises. And then we make an additional uh, variety of tools for helping you build products, uh, testing them, and then uh, documenting. So our two kind of flagship products are SQL Century and then uh, Century One Document or S1 Doc. And what that does is it not only builds a data dictionary, but it finds all dependencies upstream and downstream. So let's say you have a SQL Server system that is, um, it gets daily feeds from the point of sale cash registers. It pulls those in using SSIS. And then it, once it's done in the production database, that data also moves down to, let's say, a analysis services data warehouse and then there's some Tableau reports written by one team. There's some Power BI reports on another uh, team. And that's what document will actually be able to tell you, hey, if I change a, a data type uh, at the start of this whole chain of custody of data, what do I, what else do I have to change? You know, do I have to change the production SQL server or the staging SQL server? Do I have to change the, the data warehouse and the reports that come out of it or not? So if you've ever done that kind of work in the past, 
which I have, uh, this would have saved me hundreds of hours. Um, it just didn't exist at the time. The one product I will actually show today is free. It's called Plan Explorer. And it's not just free free, it is so free we don't even ask for an email address. That's part of the reason why I, um, I'm, I'm unabashed in showing it off. You, you won't get pestered or spammed or anything like that. And the feature set in Plan Explorer is amazing. Really, really capable of helping you do query tuning in ways that you just can't do with Management Studio. Okay, so we'll, we'll take a look at that. And then finally, we have some uh, free resources that I want to make sure you're aware of. Um, if you like this webinar today uh, and this content that I'm presenting, if you want to go to century1.com slash webinar library, I have um, probably 10 or 12 more hours of query tuning advice with demos and things like that. Um, and usually it's either me or me and my colleague, Aaron Bertrand, um, describing different kinds of ways to improve your code quality. We also have uh, century1.com slash resources where we have a bunch of eBooks. They're normally $10 each in the Amazon Kindle web store, but you can get them for free in the resources section. And then our, our two blogs, uh, sqlperformance.com, which is really hard hitting kind of deep dives into SQL behavior and blogs.century1.com. All right, so uh, just a word about myself. Um, I'm a columnist for Database Trends and Applications magazine. I've been a Microsoft MVP since 2003. Um, I actually started in the mid 80s uh, working for NASA. Uh, this was when relational databases were brand new. And uh, I knew how to write a SQL statement. But more importantly, I was also uh, pretty good with Fortran. And since they hadn't invited, invented stored procedures yet, that was how you wrote conditional processing and use things like variables. You do it all in Fortran and embed a SQL you know, select statement, let's say, uh, with a while loop. And then you would compile it. And Oracle, that was the way Oracle could give you procedural uh, behaviors before they had invented stored procedures. So yeah, that was fun and exciting and was able to do some really neat things throughout my career over the years. So in the 90s, uh, after leaving NASA, I went to one of the, the biggest SQL Server shops uh, around in the 90s. And uh, towards the end of the 90s, I and eight other people got together and we were the original founding board members for PASS. And uh, um, your, your own uh, well-known and beloved uh, Pat Wright there uh, in your community was one of our uh, board members for at, at least one term, if not two terms, and very, very active as a volunteer in past back when I was serving on the board. So um, it's always great to, to, see, um, to see old friends like Pat. And then oh, throughout uh, the, the early 90s through today, I've written a lot of books, uh, 11 in, in total. This is one that will, uh, SQL in a nutshell is my best known book. And uh, with your permission, Andrea, what we'll do at the end of the session today is we'll just raffle off a couple of those as eBooks. And um, it's about a $50 book in the uh, O'Reilly Library. So we'll give a couple of those away as well. I have my D&D dice and everything. I'm ready to roll to see you know, what number we get so we can count down the list of people and, and uh, figure out who the winner is. Okay, so let's jump into the session. Um, what we're gonna talk about are some things that uh, really tripped me up in my early days of learning how to do SQL code. And they kind of fall into a couple categories. Things like uh, doing, uh, approaching code with the right mindset and, you know, kind of knowing how the optimizer works and what it what it does to produce a query result set and how thinking about uh, things um, a little differently than you might have if you were trained only as let's say a C-sharp developer um, those kinds of lessons learned can trip you up a little bit so we'll talk about you know how to go into this with a, uh, the right set of tools and mindset and then we'll um, spend a little time talking about overall workload and how that can impact uh, the behavior of our SQL server. And all throughout, I'll be doing demos of some different capabilities and features that you might know 
or might not know exist in SQL Server. And of course, we'll have time for Q&A um, and, and so forth. So let's, let's do the math before we jump into this too much further. Um, you know, if you have um, worked with SQL for a while, uh, the advice about being a good SQL developer, you know, you're writing stored procedures and select statements and things like that. It reminds me a lot of the advice I hear from musicians. Uh, say you're learning to play guitar. And um, you'll hear folks say things like, uh, boy, I wish I'd had a little more training on this instrument before I just jumped into it. Because I learned so many things the wrong way. And I had to unlearn them to get really good at this. And it's kind of the same way with, with SQL Server and all of the relational databases. Um, you know, they're declarative. You, you, they're not procedural. You don't write code in any of the relational databases that says start at line one, do some work, proceed to line two, do some work. You don't declare, uh, you don't just procedurally process everything through the end of the file. You might be doing that using cursors, but that's actually not the best way to do it because all the relational databases are based on a kind of theory called relational algebra. And that means these systems work really well on sets of data. They don't work well on one row processed after another row after another. In fact, there's an acronym for that in our business. It's called rebar, row by agonizing row. And so, uh, what you want to do is think about things in terms of sets. You know, every salesperson who has had a sale in this particular month, that's a set of values from uh, the appropriate tables. And so what happens rather than that procedural approach is the declarative approach where you simply tell SQL Server or MySQL or PostgreSQL or Oracle or what have you, you tell it what you want using SQL language and it decides using the optimizer how the most efficient way is to get that information. So let's do the math on a kind of query you have probably already worked with. Let's take a look at um, a query that has four tables, right? We've got table A, B, C, and D. Each of those tables has a clustered index and three non-clustered indexes. There's nothing particularly remarkable about that kind of schema. But when we do the math, you begin to see some interesting things that accumulate here. For each table, and we're talking about four tables now, for each table, we have 72 different physical access methods, which means how do we get to this data physically? For example, we can have an ordered clustered index scan or an unordered clustered index scan. We can have an ordered, um, partial clustered index scan, we can have a, an ordered or an ordered partial index scan, which is also called a range scan. We can have uh, key lookups involved. We can have, oh, we can have covering indexes, if you've ever heard that term, where when our query only asks for salesperson ID, and that's the key of the table and an indexed column of the table, we don't even have to look at the table itself. We can just look at the the index to get the value out of it that we want. So that saves us all kinds of physical access of the data. So we have 72 of those for each of the four tables. Then on top of that, one of the things that uh, SQL Server does, and the different optimizers do, is they will reorder the, the joins that appear in a query. So they don't always just start with the first table joined to the second table. The reason for that is let's say we have a result set of a million records that might be used to render an answer to you. However, each of the different search arguments that we apply filter out a bunch of records. If we started out with A joined to B, B to C, C to D, it actually means that we're going to carry 700,000 of those records forward through each of the steps of the query. But on the other hand, if we started with C to D, that eliminates 700,000 records and we only have to carry 300,000 records forward from step to step. That means SQL Server on its very first step can save us a ton of memory needed to process that query and lower 
our uh, memory grants for that query. So SQL Server will rearrange every join to see if we can filter out more records earlier in the process uh, and more effectively apply the search argument. 24 of those. And then on top of that, we have a variety of different things like, well, we've got four joins, but SQL Server can choose between three different algorithms to best optimize the join. It can use a nested loop, it can use a merge join, and a hash join. And so when you add all of these different things up together, SQL Server for a relatively simple four table join is gonna be looking at about 26,000 different execution plans, okay? Wow, I mean, you know, when I think about it, I'm kind of uh, uh, pleased that SQL Server even returns a result at all. How does SQL Server do this? Well, what it does is it does not try to find the best execution plan. What it tries to do is find an optimal execution plan. And so what's the difference between optimal and best? Well, it, uh, if we were weighing the optimal plan and the best plan, uh, the measuring point is the time it takes to produce a, a good enough execution plan. It, it reminds me of my older daughter's uh, dating strategies. I'd be like, honey, this guy's no good for you. She's like, well, he's good enough for me. So um, that's kind of the way SQL Server is. It's, uh, it's, it may not be the very best plan, but it's gonna be good enough. And so as the, you know, the comic here illustrates, the difference in time it takes to analyze all 26,000 of these execution plans is ridiculous. It, it can take a really long time. But to just pick the very first one that's pretty good that we encounter, let's just go with that. And um, if you're really curious about this topic, I have some really deep dive sessions on how the optimizer works. And so I'll give you some pointers to those at the end of the session so you can watch videos on that or get the slide decks on that concept. But this is what SQL Server is trying to do, is trying to choose between all these different strategies and the way you write your queries has a huge impact on how SQL Server will be able to most effectively find a good enough plan. And so that's what we're doing today. I'm gonna to show you some things that will help you do that, okay? So just make sure there's no questions at this point in the chat, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, cool. So when I was uh, first starting out uh, in my early 20s, um, writing SQL code. Uh, I was very experienced in, with Oracle, but I switched over to SQL Server. And um, so one of the first tasks I was given was to accelerate the speed of some really big queries, uh, some really big reporting processes. And this, keep in mind, I've been working with SQL Server since before it was a Windows product, because it was running on OS2 back in those days. And um, but this was around SQL 6.0, I think, for this particular project. And so what you had back then in terms of the tools available to you was a very tiny subset of tools. Um, we, don't, uh, we don't use any of the, like the UIs and stuff like that that we used to have back in those days. And uh, so what I did was, I think what a lot of people do is I relied on my stopwatch, right? I, I wrote, uh, I took a look at this really, really big query and I ran it to see how, what, how it behaved. Uh, I turned on some debugging kind of flags so it would you know, print out intermediate results and okay, studying it. And then I said, all right, I see some opportunities to tune this. And when somebody tells you they are tuning a query, what that means is they're just trying different ways to, to get the same result set using different um, SQL code. So like one of the things that we used to do a lot back in those days was SQL Server would actually produce very different execution plans for a correlated subquery than for the exact same result set that you got by using a join statement, right? So I looked at the query and I said, okay, yeah, I'm going to rewrite this one subquery into a join and then test that to see how much faster or slower it goes. And so, um, so I rewrote the query and I ran it a second time, had my stopwatch out and it was, it was awesome. It went from like 20 minutes down to 20 seconds. I was like, woohoo, I am a transact SQL demigod. I am so good at this. And, and one of the older gentlemen on our team walks by and he says, hey, Kevin, you know, that's cool. I'm, 
I'm impressed. Um, tell me, what did you do uh, about the caches? And I said, uh, what are these caches you speak of, oh, master? You know, and he's like, mm, help you, I will not. Um, so uh, uh, Richard Epps was his name. He became my uh, Yoda and helped me learn a lot. So what it, here's what had happened. SQL Server has two main caches and lots of small caches in its buffer pool where it, it's set aside for memory. And uh, so SQL Server, uh, the two main uh, caches are the data cache and the plan cache. So what had happened was when I did all that debugging and um, wrote that, rewrote that store procedure with that one change, the first of many changes, it created a new execution plan and put that into the plan cache. And then it looked at all the tables that I was referencing and the indexes used, and it put those into the data cache. Now keep in mind, this is in the in like 94. So everything was on really slow hard disks back then. And um, so the second time after I had made changes to the query, what it did was it said, okay, I can't use the existing query plan for this, but I can reuse all the data that's in the cache. And so the reason it was so much faster wasn't because I was so great at writing transact SQL code. The reason it was faster is because all the caches that I needed to interrogate had been warmed up already by the previous run of the query. See? So uh, back in those days, we, we struggled with this problem because you, there weren't even commands to clear the cache. Back in those days, all you could do was restart SQL Server. And um, even then, a development server, you know, we're used to having our workstation, our laptop as a development server with just us on it. But back then, they were too expensive. We had 20 or 30 developers working on a single development SQL Server. So what we had to do back then was something called warm cache testing not very effective. Uh, what that means is you actually run it once and you don't even pay attention to the results or how long it takes. Then you run it a second time and you watch to see what kind of information you get back. And you uh, pull the different performance metrics that you can collect and then you run it, um, then you make the changes and run it first and Pay no attention to the first run and only measure it on the second run. That way you know you are looking at at least apples to apples instead of a cold cache versus a warm cache. Now we know both of them are the same. So instead of that, now what you can do is you can make sure every time you run a, a test or do some changes, you can make sure that you have a cold cache, which represents the worst possible case for your end users. So let me show you that in, um, in demo here. So basically I realized I needed to create a test harness so that everything would be the same and consistent between uh, uh, sequential runs of a set of SQL code. So for example, you might have a situation where you have a lot of code you need to run as a batch. And so you, know, you could use the start and end time uh, and collect that at the beginning, run your SQL code, collect that at the end. Um, so this simply gives you the total runtime of a large batch. The next thing I do is there's an internal behavior of SQL Server in which if you have pages that have changed in the data cache but have not yet been written in the hard disk and hardened to the, the MDF file of the database, um, that happens every minute or so by default in a process called the checkpoint, which is actually a command you can issue. And so uh, what I do is I always make sure to issue a checkpoint command just because I don't want um, the IO subsystem to spin up and do a checkpoint right in the middle of me running a query because that could skew the results in terms of how long it takes to process a query because it's doing the checkpoint at that time. So that's the first thing I do. Then the next thing I do is I clear out those caches. So drop clean buffers clears out the data cache. The checkpoint clears out uh, any dirty buffers, right? So I've checkpoint clears the dirty buffers or dirty pages. A drop clean buffers clears out the clean buffers and then free proc cache clears out all the plans in the, um, in the plan cache. So this means basically I have a pristine uh, environment in memory and it represents the worst case scenario that my end users would experience. They have to uh, generate everything and load everything into memory for that to work. 
Another thing, uh, and these were the only two kind of telemetry options we had back in those early days, was the set statistics command. So set statistics IO shows you all of the low level IO happening, and then set statistics time tells us how much CPU is occurring at a given moment. So I would run those, I still use them today. And by the way, you can also get to those by going to the query menu and going down to query options. And then you can see there's uh, general here and then we have advanced where you'll see things like set statistics IO and set statistics time on. So there's a couple ways you can enable it, but I just use a command. Once I've set that, then I can run my SQL statement. And so if I execute this, at least for, I'll show you about execution plans in a moment, but the two things we enabled at this point are the statistic statements. And so their goodness appears on the messaging tab. And so we can ignore this right here for the moment. And what you will see is all uh, in, the, in the space below, you'll see all the different physical and logical reads that are happening for this statement to fully process. And if you didn't look closely, you'd notice, wow, look at all these different objects here. Uh, of course, on a second look, I can see there's a V right here in the object name. So that tells me this is a view, right? I've got a lot going on in this view. Uh, a lot of different tables and so forth are being accessed. Um, so let's look at that. This is the first set of yellow flags of things you might need to pay attention to. First thing is, if you see any of this referencing to something called a work file or a work table, that tells us with certainty that SQL Server has created temporary work objects in TempDB. And TempDB on most SQL servers, because we have a lot of databases on there, is, is getting thrashed all the time. Um, another thing is that you want to pay attention to physical reads, okay? So, uh, physical reads means it, SQL Server had to go to the IO subsystem, usually the slowest part of our SQL Server, and pull whatever it needs up into the cache, the data cache in this case. So what we see is we have 387 log reads. That means 387 8K pages, all right? Then we have two physical reads. Well, what does that mean? Uh, what it means actually in this case is it engaged the read ahead behavior of SQL Server, and it read in 64K extents. So it was able to read a lot faster. And once it was loaded into the, uh, it did that to, uh, you know, get all this data quicker, loads it into the cache, and then it can read directly from memory. So the logical reads are memory, physical reads are from the IO subsystem. So that lets us know it's slow, slow-ish. Um, so what I look for is if I see scan counts uh, that are pretty high, and particularly if I see really high uh, physical reads or moderately high logical reads. In this case, you know, it's the only way to answer the query. So yeah, I kind of expect that. Um, so this would be about, what, uh, 24, uh, 2,400 kilobytes. So that's a, a few megabytes to answer the query. So that's on the... Um, IO side, and then down below, we see the CPU behavior. It took 203 seconds to create the execution plan, um, about a fifth of a second, and then it took 1.6 seconds to uh, clock time to chrono uh, you know, chronologically start to finish to complete that processing, okay? And then if we go the step further here, and I'm gonna go ahead and enable actual execution plans, and I execute that, we'll see that those statistics IO um, values that came back to us correlate very directly with the query that is processed by the view. So when we look through here, we see, uh, first thing right out of the batch, uh, right out of the bat, uh, is a hash match. It's one of the three join algorithms. And every time SQL Server does a hash, it has to create the hash table in TempDB. 
So that's why we saw a work file and a work table. And then there's a second one right there. So again, we know that's probably what those two um, work sorts of objects were. And then we have to scroll down to the lower right corner and work our way to the upper left to, to follow things chronologically through the behavior of the query itself. You may not have seen it before, but if you have a situation where you have a query that's a little too big, uh, there's a little plus sign in the lower right corner of Management Studio. And if you click that plus sign, I'm not sure if it's actually gonna show up over there. Um, it will pop up a little window uh, that shows the full size of the query in tiny little print. And so you can kind of move around inside of that and see um, how big your query is and, and different things uh, like that according, uh, relating to navigation. But again, to find out what is the real stinker in this particular query, we have to actually go down the list of all these different act um, job steps I'm sorry, I should say execution plan steps. And we have to look for those uh, operators that cost a lot, that are expensive. So here we have an index scan that is 14% of the total query cost. So maybe we could get rid of that index scan and uh, you know it's gonna uh, give us a little bit better behavior. That's all to say that this is all about building uh, that test harness, you know, kind of the, uh, think of a workman and a workbench and you've got vices to hold it in place so that it, you can work on it effectively. That's the purpose of what this is, all this code is for, for you when you're writing SQL statements. You want the same kind of stuff to happen every time and in a reliable and predictable way. Now, let's move on. Um, when we are executing a query, SQL Server has three domains, three areas in which it looks when deciding what the execution plan will be. The first one that many of us know about is commonly called metadata. And when we say metadata, most of us think about um, indexes and the, uh, there's another feature inside of SQL Server called auto create statistics. So if there are some columns that you keep using as search arguments, uh, let's say hire date in the employee table, and it doesn't have an index on it, SQL Server will say, hmm, you're using that as a search argument an awful lot. So I'm gonna create statistics on it as if it were an index. Um, there's actually a level below the index statistics called a histogram. And that shows you the distribution of records across the entirety of the index. So you might have one part of the index that's very light on records and there's only a couple dozen and another part, you've got two or three million records deep according to that index. You know, let's say your Wayfair, uh, you know, the big uh, retail, online retail company. And 10 years ago, you had customer or you had higher date uh, employees, you know, just a few at a time. But then as you got bigger and bigger, you started to hire hundreds of people at a time. And so that side of the index is very deep. So that's one kind of set of uh, information used to create an execution plan, but there's actually two more. So the next one are set options. And so I believe it was uh, Jay uh, when we were um, prepping for the session who was talking about he's gonna do in the future a session on collation. And that's one of the things that's considered a sort of the set configuration options. So for example, one time I was in uh, Israel working at uh, one of my company's offices in Tel Aviv and all the local workstations there were set to, um, in Windows, Hebrew collation. And I connected back to a server at our South California headquarters set the standard IS uh, American uh, collation, both in Windows and in SQL Server. And what happened there is if I ran a query on that server because I was uh, attaching to it and connecting to it with a Hebrew collation, even if Andrea had written the exact same query that I had just written, it would not be able to find it and use it in the plan cache because their collations are different. And that means at a binary level, they aren't the same. And so SQL Server wouldn't be able to match those plans. There's a few other things in the set options like, um, you can use different set um, ANSI SQL set commands. Like you could say set ANSI nulls off, or you could set 
a RIF overflow on, you know, some of those things. And you can put those into ODBC strings and OLADB connection strings. And so those will cause SQL Server to produce different execution plans, one from the other that are otherwise identical. And then finally, the, the final domain that makes decisions about how SQL Server creates execution plans is actual hardware, okay? And so my laptop, for example, has four cores, eight gigabytes of RAM. Let's say I worked in a big enterprise where the, the main production SQL Server had a 128 cores and a terabyte of RAM. You know that my computer is going to give me very different execution plans than what is in production. So how about I teach you how to get the exact same execution plans on this, sir, on this little four core computer compared to that 128 core one we have in production. You know that old story about, it, hey, it worked great on my machine. Well, now we can actually make sure that it works great both on my machine and the one in production. And here's what we do. We're gonna do something called cloning, okay? Um, so there's two main steps to do this. Uh, there is a command called dbcc clone database, but I actually don't prefer to teach that method because that will create a clone database um, right next to the other one, the main one that you're mimicking, it'll create it on that server. And there's not currently switches or ways for you to create it on a different server. So what I wanna do is create a version of production here on my laptop that produces the exact same execution plans as production. So I'm gonna show you a slightly more, um, it's got a couple steps more. And then I'm gonna show you how to fake that out as well in terms of telling SQL Server that you've got 64 or 128 CPUs and that you've got a gigabyte of RAM or terabyte of RAM. So let me show you that in demo. So the first thing you have to do is you have to create that database. And the way you do that is you open up Management Studio, right click on the database that you want to clone and right click on it. And you will see that there is an option there called script database but do not use that because that is a lie. Um, what we want to do instead, uh, we are gonna script the database, but we're gonna go to tasks and come down to the option that says generate script, okay? Click that, it's a standard wizard that appears. Um, you can choose to script the entire database or just specific objects. Um, I would say, you know, do the whole database. And the secret ingredient in the recipe is right here under this advanced button. Now, if you've ever scripted a database in the past, you know that everything is empty, right? Well, what we can do is we can actually change that default behavior and we can tell SQL Server, bring over the indexes exactly as how um, production thinks they exist. So even though the tables um, that we create right, you know, immediately afterwards uh, are empty, it will still give the query optimizer cardin cardinality estimates the same as what's in production. It will still think that there's 30 million records in table um, sales order detail because we're gonna copy that over. And the way to do that is there's an option that says script statistics. And by default, it never does but we can pick from this dropdown list, not just scripting statistics, we can also choose to script statistics and those histograms, which are a level deeper than just the top level statistics of an index, okay? So um, I'm gonna cancel out of this because I've already generated it, but there's a couple things that you wanna note. The first is it will create the um, files underneath that database in exactly the way they are in production. So you probably have to change the size of those and maybe you don't want 16 um, data files, so you could change that. The second thing you'll need to do is both um, of these commands, alter database, set auto create statistics and set auto update statistics will be turned on in that output and you must turn those off if you want those to work because SQL Server will eventually come back and kind of uh, paint over the original statistics you pulled down from production with whatever is actually in the tables. And so you don't want it to do that. Um, 
you want it to keep the numbers that it extracted from production. Then the next thing you want to do, uh, well, I want to do for you, is just show you this interesting little nuance. When you normally script out a database, you don't see what we're looking at right here. And you can see over on the right-hand side my, um, uh, where I am on the scrolling. Way far down, we start to see all these statements that say update statistics, and here's the, here's the index name, and then it says with stats stream. And most people haven't, you know, haven't seen that before. And what is stat stream? Well, when you look at that, it's a very long hexadecimal stream. This is actually everything that is written down in the index metadata. So we have literally copied that entire domain of the three circle Venn diagram, and we've reproduced it. Even though there's no records in the tables yet, SQL Server thinks there are. And so it will use these values when it calculates its execution plans. Um, you'll also see some objects that it'll say uh, uh, create statistics and then it'll say underscore WA underscore. Does anyone know what those are? Um, it, it, this is a lesson for those of us who are developers who are like, I use whatever name I want to. Uh, you know, my code will never be exposed to the public. Um, when this feature was implemented, it was uh, when the Seahawks, uh, Seattle Seahawks were in contention for the Super Bowl. And the developer who was writing this stuff was like, yeah, Washington, go. And so he decided to name all of the objects that SQL's feature to auto create statistics, whenever it automatically creates some statistics, it named them w, uh, underscore WA underscore. And so uh, what the heck, that's, um, that's what he chose for the names of it. And so now we know, okay, that's a internally created uh, SQL Server statistics for a particular object in there. And so it carries those over as well. Um, of course, you need to put data in that database, but the cool thing is you can um, put as much data in there as you want. So you can actually get this database to act just like that one terabyte database in production, even if you only have 300 megabytes of data in there. So I included a little script uh, that I used, uh, the BCP, uh, the old school program to bulk copy data out to flat files and then bulk copy data back in uh, to the SQL server. And then, so there's the big circle for the um, statistics. There's the smaller circle for the, B, uh, for the hardware. And we can actually fake out SQL server in that regard too. So here is a, a simple query we're going to run in the AdventureWorks database. Let me actually go ahead and grab this whole thing. And I execute it. Caching the data now, pulling that up into the cache. And um, in fact, you know what? I actually uh, forgot to pull the execution plan on this. But again, this... Uh, this little SQL server has four cores. It has um, eight gigabytes of RAM, but I've actually only given SQL server like 500 megabytes because it's a demo system and I want it to show memory pressure. So execution plan, pull that out. And notice each step along the way, there's that little circle there with two arrows. That means it's parallelizing throughout its entire process. And then there's a sort operation right here. Sorts are very expensive. Now, let me tell this SQL server that I don't have four CPUs, I have 64 CPUs. And I don't have um, 500 megabytes, I have a terabyte of RAM. So let's run that. So it successfully ran. Now SQL server thinks that's the hardware environment of my, uh, uh, that I'm processing in. And so when I execute this particular query, let's take a look at the uh, execution plan here. So it does actually decide to parallelize it and do pretty much the exact same thing it did before. However, we can go the opposite direction. Uh, a lot of times when we get great big SQL servers, we can, um, we'll take that, 128 CPU box, and we'll turn it into quite a, you know, half a dozen SQL servers that have 
two CPUs each because they're just doing some very commodity kind of work. So in a situation like that, we could go the other direction. We could say, you know what? I want you to pretend like you have only one or two CPUs and that you only have 256 megabytes of RAM. So if we run this, it stays in, a, in effect until I turn it off. And then I can run the same query again. And I've got, okay, good deal. And now let's run that. Look at the execution plan. Is that the same plan we had a minute ago? No, not at all. Notice we've got no parallelism. Now we have a sort way early in the process, whereas before is over here on the left-hand side. And we even have a warning pop up here on the select. So it's telling us that we have an implicit conversion happening there. Uh, so this is just a cool way to mimic what you have in production. It will give you execution plans that are just like what are in production. Does that mean it will perform just like what's in production in terms of the clock or in terms of the reads of the writes? No, uh, that's not the case. Uh, it makes sure that you can have the right or the exact same execution plans and then you can do troubleshooting on those execution plans or performance tuning after you've had a chance to take a look at them. Um, so when you're done with this, make sure you turn it off because that will stay in effect for your session until you're done. So you use the reset all statement there, okay? Now, what is a red flag? You know, so if you haven't read execution plans, um, you know, what, what do I need to look for? I've got a slide here that tells you all about the red flags but I'll actually show you in demo a little bit uh, more about that. Basically, there's a, a whole bunch, hundreds of execution plan steps, but there's really only five or six that you actually need to be really concerned about. For example, if you see that there are really big scans, like table scans or clustered index scans, if you see key lookups, that's something that's pretty easy to tune and fix. If you see sorts or spools or spills that are really big, that's another one to look at. And that implicit conversion that I had pointed out a time or two, that's a really big deal. So again, let's take a look at some code here. And I'm also gonna show you this, or as we move along, I'm gonna show you some of these demos in Plan Explorer because it becomes a lot more visible when you look at these in Plan Explorer. So I'm gonna turn on my execution plans. It's this button right here on my dashboard, uh, but you can also, um, pick it off of the query list and say include actual execution plans. And so what we want to make sure first and foremost on is that SQL Server is taking advantage of indexes that exist on the different tables that you're collecting data from. And a good index usage is based on search arguments. Uh, and those are called SARGs for short. So for example, if we've got a, if we're looking for some data from the sales order header table, and we tell it to find all of the um, sales order IDs from a specific salesperson, because there is a index on that column, SQL Server is able to use the index to go directly to the record or records that it needs instead of scanning the whole table. And so what that gives us is a very small, efficient execution plan. And it says it gives a, uh, that it's using an index seek. That's on the right-hand side. Uh, and then you read towards the left, right? Um, so index seek, nice and efficient. Okay, cool. Now, what about if we say, I wanna find all the salespersons of 283 and greater? I remember what I said a minute ago. Um, SQL Server works in sets and is to, uh, salesperson ID 283 or greater. Is that a set? Yes. So when we execute this one, again, we're going to get a very nice, tight, efficient execution plan. Again, it's able to use that clustered or that index seek where it goes right to the value it needs. And now it's going to do a little bit of scanning forward from that point, but it's able to be, perform very, very efficiently. Now, here's, here's an interesting thing, though, that even experienced SQL developers don't know. Do you think it's going to be um, a nice, simple, straightforward execution plan if we tell SQL Server to find 
everything except salesperson ID 283? Well, let's take a look and see. So we execute that and you know we should be able to see a, a nice, tight, efficient execution plan. Whoa, look at this. It's much, much bigger. We've got constant scans, we've got compute scalers, we have a sort happening and sorts, as we mentioned, are very resource intensive. We've got uh, a nested loop join. What's going on? Here's, here's the, uh, the moral of this story. Anytime you tell a relational database to find not a value, it actually has to go and find the presence of all the values and throw those away one by one until it has everything that's left over. And then it can answer your question because it thinks in terms of sets. So another way you can greatly improve the performance of your queries is when you're looking for not a specific value is to rewrite your query in a way that is using sets but still logically answers the question properly. So here I was saying, everybody but 283? Well, I can logically reproduce that same result set by saying where all of the salesperson IDs are greater to, I'm sorry, um, salesperson IDs are greater than 283 or they are less than 283, but neither of those sets includes 283, but they are two sets. So now let's look at this particular query and see what that execution plan looks like. Boom, back to two operations to complete this query. Wow. Uh, another thing too is what about if we have uh, a correlated subquery, like we say where salesperson ID is in a subquery, or maybe we say where, where salesperson ID exists. Um, well, how does this behave when we do that sort of uh, situation? Okay, so we have two queries, one query nested in the other. So basically we have two nice index seeks, one on the person table and then one on the sales order uh, header table or detail table. And it just uses a nested join to put those two results sets together as it goes along. Very, uh, very nice, efficient join algorithm. But what if we said where it's not in the subquery? Let's take a look at this one. Again, the query plan explodes out in complexity because we have to eliminate everything not in that subquery, uh, all of the things that are in the subquery rather, and throw those away to get to what isn't. And this is a, uh, the kind of thing that a lot of people are really surprised about. I don't have an example here, but um, I always uh, quiz the attendees, how can I rewrite this to give me a query that only works in sets in the same way I rewrote, I rewrote this one as greater than and less or less than, um, how can I rewrite this one so that it gives me that same kind of benefit? Kind of gave a hint to it about the old days of SQL Server. Anytime you have a correlated subquery, you can rewrite that as a join. And Anytime you want to uh, join together result sets where one of the two tables is missing values, you can use an outer join. And so to get the best performance for this query, I would rewrite it as an outer join and uh, I'll get the data that I want, but it will be in the same way that we got two tables uh, in the previous uh, index leaks, sorry, index seeks on the two tables in the previous execution plan. Same thing happens here where I'd have just too simple and um, very direct, very uh, precise, concise um, index seeks rather than this big mess of code that we see down here. Make sense? All right. So I have a quick question on that. Yes. So just like you did with the numbers, could you do something similar to like greater than Campbell and less or less than Campbell, or is that not how you would do it? Uh, I'm sure you could probably continue to keep it as a um, as a related query, okay. right? So you could say where it's less than Campbell and, or greater than Campbell, and okay. then have another and to the where clause for the first name. 
Mm -hmm. um, however, I just naturally go to joins now. So um, that that's kind sense. of, uh, yeah, that's kind of how my mine works. And it, okay. it does depend on the domain of data too. So I don't know, maybe it's possible you have multiple David Campbells, but they live in different states or something like that. So you'd have to know the data well to know whether that would work or not. Okay. But um, yeah, that's kind of a, I should probably come up with a better example. No, no, it's well, a great example. <laughs> for clarity's sake, can you show us the join? I'd have to write it. I, I, I have to apologize. I did not write the full join for that. Yeah. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll do that afterwards and we'll make sure that we get that into um, the follow-up email that includes the uh, slides and the scripts and all that stuff. All right, let's plunge on because I think I'm only on number four here and we've already spent a half an hour talking. Um, so one of the things that is also kind of new to a lot of SQL developers is that you, you need to optimize the code uh, for the workload and your indexes for the workload. However, Management Studio does not actually help you in that way. So if I flip back over to Management Studio, let me see. I believe one of the queries that, oh, I've already closed that, uh, that window out. One of the queries actually showed a warning for implicit uh, conversion. And uh, another of the warnings said there was missing statistics. Um, you got to keep in mind when those kind of warnings and such appear, that SQL Server is only advising you based on that one query or whatever the transaction is that you have in that window. So if you are uh, applying changes that you see come up in that window and you're applying it to production, that may be something that's really bad for the overall workload and it's only good for that one specific query. You have to keep that in mind. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is that when you add indexes, that improves the, po possibly improves, usually improves read performance, but it adds overhead to your write operations. So anytime you're doing inserts, updates, deletes, perhaps you're doing merge statements, um, then that actually makes things slower. Um, there's kind of usually a balancing point. Uh, a, a, a dozen or less indexes probably are not gonna make any difference. Uh, to your right workload. But if you have 100 indexes or 50 or 60 indexes on a table, that will definitely make a big difference. Um, there's, a, there's a couple reasons for that. The first reason to keep in mind is that anytime you do an insert or a delete, say, that changes the index and that changes uh, every index other non-clustered index on that table. Because what the non-clustered indexes do is they include the clustered index within them to find the specific row that's needed. So I mentioned higher data a while ago for an employee table. If I deleted 30 employees, um, the index on the higher date would have to take care of those 30 records too and get rid of those. And then if I added 100 it, uh, to the base table, it also have to add those, not just to the higher date non-clustered index, but every other non-clustered index out there. So it has this multiplicative effect in terms of the amount of write operations that happen for each additional non-clustered index that you put on a table. The other thing that happens too is fragmentation, okay? And so when we have a, a table structure, it's called a B tree plus structure in SQL Server. And some people said binary tree, um, and that's not correct. It actually means a balanced tree. And so <clears throat> we've got the leaf level uh, pages, 8K data pages down here at the bottom. And so let's say we, this is a table about people. So we've indexed last name. When we create uh, that index, SQL, and uh, let's say that's the clustered index, SQL Server actually literally physically changes the order and sorts all of the records at the leaf level. So when that index is created, it creates these, unless you specify otherwise, it creates those completely full, 100% full. So now if I come back and need to add somebody whose last name is Allred, right there on the first page, and it's already full, SQL Server has to do a very, very expensive operation called a page split. 
So it doesn't just make room for that one record to be added. What it does is it says, okay, Allred would go right about in the middle of this page. I'm gonna actually take and create a new page. I'm gonna move all the records from where it would go over to the new page and also move that new insert and put it on the new page. The thing about that is that the new page is just in whatever open space SQL Server can find anywhere on the IO subsystem. So it doesn't make as big of a difference on SSDs, but if you still have hard disks, this is a performance killer. It will really slow you down. So uh, there's two ways to fix it. One is to perform regular index maintenance. So rebuild or reorg your indexes on a regular basis. And uh, some people will tell you that's not very important, but I disagree with them. You should do this on the regular. Um, and the uh, second way to do this is when you build or reorganize the indexes, rebuild the indexes, there's a setting called fill factor. And that means how full do you want each of these 8K pages to be when we rebuild the index? And my default, if I know nothing about the system except that it's an OLTP transaction processing system, my default is 80% full. So I'm always leaving a little bit of open space on each of those 8K data pages for new records or things like that to, to happen. On the other hand, if you have a very write heavy application, you know, it's a data warehouse, you really do want that to be 100% full because you're not doing a lot of inserts and updates and deletes. Um, and every page that's full means one less page that SQL Server has to fetch to do all of your BI processing. Does that make sense? Any questions? All right, so let's plunge on. Um, so we were talking about indexes here. Another thing that uh, is surprising to a lot of folks is that when you put a um, function call onto one of the search arguments in a query, those function calls tell SQL Server, you can't use the index anymore. Um, so again, uh, let's say we have um, where higher date is null, and then there's, it says higher date is null, use the value January 1st, 2020. And then it says equal to uh, the parameter or what have you. Well, you're not gonna get lots of those nice index seeks. At the very best you can get is an index scan which means SQL Server will have to look at every single value in the index rather than going just to the value it needs and reading from that point. So it's, instead of saving all of the work and going straight from the root to the intermediate page or pages then to the leaf page, you actually have to do a full scan across that index across all the pages if you use those functions. Now, here's an uh, add on to that there's a behavior in SQL Server that is uh, insidious, it's evil, it's a ninja assassin, and it's called implicit conversions. This is also a reason why, if you're running on an older version of SQL Server, let's say you um, still have SQL 2014 as your primary production SQL platform, I encourage you right now to go out and download the latest version of SQL Server Management Studio. Uh, the reason for that is that the, um, it's backward compatible all the way to SQL Server 2005. And as time has gone on, they've added a lot of new features. So one of those features is detecting implicit conversions in your query. So what is an implicit conversion? What happens in a situation like that is that there are data types in SQL Server that look completely compatible. Um, for example, varchar or nvarchar. I mean, they both have the word varchar in them, right? <laughs> They've got to be compatible, right? Um, however, actually behind the scenes, they are not. SQL Server, however, is designed to make processing as easy for you as possible. So SQL Server says, oh, your stored procedures keep saying varchar, but the table definition is in varchar. So I know what you mean, and I'm gonna go ahead and convert that for you implicitly, rather than making you explicitly declare like a case statement or you know, a convert function on that. And so um, that's a way that SQL Server saves you 
you know, rewriting and prevents uh, your server from crashing, but it also is the, a really terrible performance issue, okay? There is a, um, a chart that you can download that I have here, um, 15D, uh, BD, RRA. Um, you can get it there. And then there's also, it may be impacted, impacted by um, a data type precedence, but let me take it a step further and illustrate for you a little bit more. Okay, so implicit conversion, lots of extra work. So SQL Server wasn't expecting this based on the, you know, the initial uh, look at the metadata. And so uh, it can actually cause a very large spike in CPU. It can really reduce the amount of batch requests per second your SQL Server can process, and it can really slow it down. The main domain, uh, the main areas that I find this happens is when we are converting between integer data types, like small int, tiny int, big int, and we are uh, also comparing that those values to like numeric, decimal, money, anything that has a floating, you know, decimal point in it, they're both numbers, right? Well, not to SQL Server. One is integer data type, not natively compatible to the, um, uh, to the uh, floating point data types. Same thing with char and varchar versus nchar and nvarchar. Those are not directly compatible. And, and think about it too. Um, a, a varchar is standard encoding, which means two bits per digit of the string. But nvarchar is unicode, which means it can support lots of additional languages. And it's four bits per single digit in a text string. So at a binary level, a varchar value that says um, KEV, says, you know, my first three um, letters of my first name, and KEV and Unicode, not the same thing. And so it has to convert them behind the scenes. So let me show you this in a demo in case you've never actually seen this happening. Um, very simple use case here. Let me see. Got a table called product category. And notice here that category ID is an integer. However, category ID in the next table is a varchar 10, okay? So I've created both of these tables. Now I'm gonna insert uh, a few values into these tables. Now, let's go ahead and write a query that is looking at these at the join here. Okay, and let me turn on my execution plans. Returns the result set, no problem, right? SQL Server says, hey, I'll take care of that for you. But behind the scenes, guess what we've got here? We've got a clustered index seek. Good, we want it to seek. But on the other table, we've got a clustered index scan. How many records of a table are in the clustered index? all of them, right? So we're basically doing a full table scan uh, to resolve this query. And it's all because one, da uh, one data type does not explicitly convert to the other. And I, I have bad news for you if you use any of the ORMs. So if you use Entity Framework or, oh, heaven forbid you use um, in Hibernate, uh, then those cause implicit conversions all over the place. They are designed, it's a bug. It's not a bug, I'm sorry. It's a feature, not a bug. They are designed to act that way. And this can even happen within a single query. So here I've got three queries against the, the same base table. And you know, notice we have, in some cases, we have an apostrophe, and then other cases we have an in apostrophe. And that means it's, uh, it's um, in varchar or in char. And so again, all return a nice result set. However, when we look at these execution plans, we see in one case, uh, it actually provokes the second two, which are in quotes, don't provoke it, but the first case where it is not in quotes, what does SQL Server think that this value is? What kind of data type does it think it is here? It thinks it's an integer and integers 
do not directly convert to uh, any of the text data types. So this one causes an implicit conversion and it tells you that it costs 6% more, 37% as opposed to 31% to complete that query in exactly the same way. And uh, so again, just even in a query that doesn't have any variables or anything like that, it slows you down. Now, if you are curious, uh, I included a couple helper scripts in the, um, in the library of scripts for this presentation that help you find if you have implicit conversions happening on your SQL server. So this particular one is written by uh, my buddy, Jonathan Cahayas. And so in this particular case, it, you can run it in production. It won't cause any harm. Uh, but if you have a really big server, uh, it will be looking through all of memory, uh, every, everything in the plan cache. And so it looks around to see what's out there that has a uh, com um, implicit conversion happening and it returns a result set to tell you if that's the case. All right, it's taking a little bit of time. Um, the second query in this, I'll explain that while the other one processes. This is written by um, a gentleman out of uh, London, England. And this particular one, what it does is it looks through whatever database you might be residing in and it tells you if um, any of the similarly named tables have different data types. So if, I'm sorry, so if we have like employee and then we have contractor tables in our HR database and one has a name field, last name, and, and the other has last name, both columns have the same name, but one is Varchar 500 and one is in Varchar 500, it will show you that. So here it found uh, one of our queries that had that implicit conversion. And again, just to show you the second uh, query here, uh, one of the things that is kind of amusing about this query to me is that it is, um, don't point it at a Microsoft created database because you're gonna see that Microsoft breaks the rules all the time. <laughs> like SharePoint, no, just, just don't do it in SharePoint, you'll be sad. Um, so here it's showing differences in, in these da different data, um, I'm sorry, different columns of the same name uh, as they appear in different tables. Now, most of the time, it's not a big deal, right? So we've got a uh, uh, title for persons and for documents, right? So one is Varchar 5th, in Varchar 50, one is in Varchar 8. No problem, we won't get implicit conversions. Um, but sometimes you will. And so this is a nice way to see if the database that, that your dev team designed is, is gonna cause you problems in the future, or maybe a packaged product that you bought and put into production is gonna cause you a problem. Um, I haven't, uh, I've still got a couple slides to go, but we're at half past. Is it okay if we keep going? I think we should keep going. Okay. If you guys have objections, put it in the in the chat, but I think we should keep going. There was a quick comment in the chat that they, they said, Isnil, uh, yes, people are saying keep going. Um, Isnil in where clauses keep burning me from a .NET developer perspective, entity framework causes many implicit conversions for us, especially in Varchar and Varchar, like you mentioned. Good deal, yeah. Well, thank you for validating that. Um, <laughs> so what I'll do here so we can get out a little bit quicker is uh, I do have slides that kind of introduce each of these topics, but let's do the fun part and uh, stick with the, the demos. And um, so what I'm gonna show you as we move forward, next couple ones, how many of us use, demo, uh, use cursors, right? Raise his hand. Um, turns out that uh, you probably have heard of the terrible reputation of cursors. I'm gonna show you a better way to write cursors so that they can actually perform really, really good. Um, I'm gonna also show you why having coding standards across a team for your SQL statements, your T-SQL, is very, very important. And then finally, I'm gonna show you why you don't wanna write what we call kitchen sink stored procedures um, or do all the things kind of code. Code like this, where it says, uh, where order ID equals a parameter or it's null. Um, you know, all these kinds of, if this, then, you know, if this value is in the, the parameter, do this. If it's something else, do that. I'll show, show you a little bit more about that in just a moment. So those are the next couple demos. 
So good cursors. Um, I tried to uh, shrink down uh, two long-standing recommendations that you'll find in the SQL Server community. And both of these are actually holdovers from the, the days when SQL Server was actually a product called Sybase and um, the big iron days when everything ran on Unix. And those two recommendations are, A, cursors are really slow and difficult and painful, and B, use this statement called set no count on. And they're both still useful recommendations today that will improve your performance. The, um, the amount of improvement has decreased over the years. So if I was demoing this on a SQL Server 2008 or 2 SQL Server, or a SQL Server 2012, there would be probably a 30% performance difference between the worst case and the best case. Nowadays, it's usually in the percentiles and your mileage may vary under certain circumstances. But let me illustrate what I'm talking about and I'll explain as I go along. First, as, as uh, always when I'm working with code, I clear out those buffers. Now, here's what I'm gonna do. If I can actually make this work. I am going to first create a stored procedure that does some work, but it does everything by the default according to what SQL Server has as its defaults. So I'm gonna tell it to process some SQL statements. The cursor is gonna loop through um, you know, a large number of times. It's gonna add a value to a column, and then it's gonna close the cursor and deallocate the cursor. Now this is actually not an ANSI SQL standard. You will not find the word deallocate in the ANSI SQL standard. And that's the first thing that tells you that SQL's, uh, SQL servers, cursors are a little bit weird, okay? Um, you don't have to do that in Oracle. For example, in Oracle, uh, they actually call their select statements implicit cursors. And there's no performance difference whatsoever between a cursor and a select statement in Oracle. But in SQL Server, there is. Uh, for example, when you create and declare a cursor, SQL Server by default makes it global. And uh, what, what does that mean? Well, have you ever thought about why do we even name a cursor, give a cursor a name? Well, because cursors were around before we had stored procedures. And so what you could do is you could have all kinds of nested cursors, maybe in a different batch that called on each other. And so by default in SQL Server, all cursors are considered to be global cursors. That's why you give them a name. If you need to reference a record that is being called by uh, another batch and uh, another, you know, in another loop of iterations, so that way they can find each other. However, nobody does that anymore. Everybody just does cursors like this. Um, so some other weird behaviors inside of SQL Server and its cursors. Well, for one thing, it, it sets aside four bytes for every cursor that it's gonna have to open. Uh, so if it's 10,000 loops of your cursor, 10,000 bytes. Uh, it sets aside a bunch of lock space. Um, but another thing is when we say fetch cursor value into an ID, we could actually say fetch, and we could say next three into. And what that would do is it would say, go forward two records, read the third, go forward another two records, read the sixth, go forward another and read the ninth and so forth, skipping to reading every third record. We could also say minus three. So that says start at the end of the cursor value or uh, records and go up three and read at a time. Nobody does those sorts of functions either. Um, and then finally, another thing that we see pretty frequently is um, that there's a default behavior that allows you to update the values on the specific record of the cursor that you're work, uh, the cursor row that you're working on. That means it needs them to be readable and writable. But most of us don't do it that way. What we do is we find what the values are in our cursor up here, and then we do something else in another separate statement to that value. So that's the default here. So I'm gonna tell it everything's default in this first stored procedure. In the second stored procedure, I'm gonna write the good version 
of a cursor. And what I'm going to do there is I'm going to tell it local, meaning don't worry about other cursors that exist anywhere. All you care about is this one in this process. And I'm going to tell it fast forward, which means it is read only, not read writable, and it only goes forward through the cursor result set one record at a time. Okay. In the next stored procedure that does the exact same work, I'm going to use that set no count on statement I told you about. What that does is that tells SQL Server uh, when we execute any transact SQL statement in SQL Server, like I've highlighted the select, when I'm finished, you'll see on the messages tab this output, thousand rows affected and the time it happens. Why do we need that? A lot of the time we don't. Okay, so this turns that off, but it does something even more important than that. For some weird reason, I don't know why, any executable T-SQL statement inside of SQL Server returns this message to the console, but it's empty. So somewhere down the line, they said, oh, you know what? People don't want to hear that done in process message. That's what it's called. They don't want to hear this done in process message for declare. So rather than not have a done in process message, they just don't show it to you, even though they, they produce that output. And so if you have a cursor like this, where it's going to loop, loop through a thousand times, it's going to have a done in process message a thousand times for the open, the fetch, the while loop, for the update statements, even though it never shows them to you. And like I said, in the older versions, this made a huge difference. In the newer versions, it's, uh, it's not quite as measurable, but it's still there. And it, it is still me measurable. And then finally, what I'm going to do is I'm going to execute a query or a stored procedure that has both of these enabled at the same time. So we have set no count on and that local fast forward cursor. All right, so let me clear those caches again since I ran a SQL statement. And let's go ahead and create all these stored procedures. All right, execute. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run all of these stored procedures and anytime you have a go statement appearing in a management studio and then you put a number after that, it'll run them that number of times. So I'm gonna run all four of these five times. Uh, by the way, that won't, this go and then a number, that won't work anywhere outside of management studio. So if you put it in a PowerShell script or a SQL script and try to execute from from the um, you know from the console or something like that or invoke it, it it won't do it, but it will do it here on the um, on the screen. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull out of the query cache uh, the plan cache um, things like how many times it was executed, uh, what was the max time, and what was the total elapsed time for each of those different queries. And let me see. So this is actually kind of what I'm used to seeing lately is that everything is default and that took a total of about 34 seconds. If we turn on just those, the good cursors, uh, local fast forward, it finished in about 23 seconds. If I turned on just set no count on, it's about 27 seconds. And then finally, when I had them both turned on, it was actually about 24 seconds. So it didn't come out better than um, each of them individually. But I'm not exactly sure why that happens sometimes. Sometimes it's because Outlook is running and you know decided to download an email right in the middle of it. But in general, what you're gonna see is probably um, 15, 16, 18% performance improvement. If your code uses these constructs and you switch to the better version of the construct. So in my case, I make set no count on the first executable string in any of my stored procedures or user defined functions, um, stuff like that. Is that new for anybody? New lesson? So we had a comment and I actually shared that sentiment. That's the first time that somebody's explained set no count on in a way that made sense to me. Oh. <laughs> And yeah, I, like I know, I know it's, you're supposed to do that, but I never knew why. I just thought, oh, it's so I don't get the number returned at the bottom. Like I right. didn't know all the detail of it. So yeah. I thought that was really good. 
and you you know you can tell that the engineers are not english majors because really it's a double negative right certainly you'll be able to set count off rather than set no count on kind of kind of weird there <laughs> all right so coding standards all right so i said that coding standards are important and um you don't have to use my coding standards even though they're the right ones but you need to pick someone's coding standards on the team and stick with those throughout. Um, and again, uh, I, you know, here's my standard sorts of um, uh, clearing of caches. This is one I didn't mention earlier, system cache. So um, the big two inside of uh, the buffer pool are the data cache, which is usually around 70% of SQL servers total memory allocation. And then there's the plan cache. And that's usually around 20% to 25% of the total plan cache. And that varies according to versions of SQL Server and such. But there's also a whole bunch of a small caches. So there's log buffers, there's sort buffers, there's hash buckets, uh, there's X event buffers. And those are all um, purgeable. <laughs> I don't know if that's right. Um, uh, you can evict those from the cache by using this statement, free system cache. And then you could just say hash buckets or just sort cache, or you could say all and, and get all of those additional really small caches as well. So um, let's say uh, someone on my team is writing SQL code and they like to use camel case for their object names and they like to use uppercase for the keywords. However, they also like to fit as much as they can onto a single line, right? So um, in this case, you know, someone executes this, or they put this string into a stored procedure or what have you. So now we get a result set. And when we take a look at the plan cache, we'll see a couple things. First of all, there it is, it's resident in the plan cache. It hasn't been evicted from the cache, aged out or what have you. We can see it's been used one time. And we can see that its size in bytes is actually kind of big. It's about 41K in size, even though that query is tiny. Now, you know, I've been talking about how SQL Server will reuse execution plans. So like, let's go ahead and just re-execute this query, exact same query, come down and requery this data again from the plan cache. So now, just like we want, we see it has a use count of two, okay? So now let me go ahead and clear all my caches again. I'll it in. That will reload it into the cache. Now, uh, uh, so let's say Jay comes along and Jay is very particular uh, and he has his heart in the right place. I agree with Jay. He wants to put all of his keywords on a new line, right? So if he had a where clause, that would go on a new line. If he had a order by, that would go on a new, so forth. So aside from having a carriage return right here, completely identical to the line before, get the same results as the line before. And we know that SQL Server is smart and it reuses execution plans, right? Oh, but wait a minute our use count didn't go up. We've now got two stored procedures in there that are identical. What? And then let's say Caroline, um, one of my old, uh, my coworkers from days gone by, uh, she, um, she had really long fingernails and she was always kind of, um, you know, complaining, ah, you know, fat fingered the keys again. So there's an extra space in this one. Uh, same query. Everything about it is the same. The result set is the same. And SQL Server smart, so we know it's going to reuse that query, right? Holy smokes, now we have three queries in the plan cache that are essentially identical. All right, so if somebody else doesn't use camel case for their entity names. Are you going to you going to treat us right here SQL Server? You're going to give us a uh, again, none of the use counts have gone up at all. What's going on SQL Server? And here, some maniac who needs to be institutionalized doesn't capitalize any of their keywords. So um, let's see what happens here. Okay, now oh, SQL Server, come on. What's going on? Does, 
Does anyone know what's happening? So what's happening is when SQL Server creates a, a, um, a query plan, it actually takes a look at the query that you've written and creates a hash of the binary and it stores that into the plan cache. I was talking with a developer who worked on these algorithms in the plan cache and he was telling me that it, it's like 26 times faster to be able to do matching against that binary hash than it is to actually have the full written SQL statements out. The only problem about that is that an uppercase S is a different binary code string than a lowercase s, right? And if we have two spaces, that's different than binary of one space. And so you'll have these plan cache misses because we've written the exact same SQL statement, but with the tiniest of variances that a human eye would say, no, it's identical, right? So take a look at your plan cache and see if you have lots of um, queries that only have a use count of one. Um, the, um, the typical way to handle that problem is to enable a, a configuration option called optimize for ad hoc workloads. And so what that does is you notice how each of these are 41K each. I mean, that's not tiny. If you have a couple hundred of these, um, then that adds up to you know, many megabytes of your RAM being wasted. So if you turn on optimize for ad hoc workloads on, what it does is it actually stores what's called a query thumbprint and uh, there's other names to it, um, but it's basically about one tenth the size uh, only like uh, instead of 41K, it'd be like 4K. And it's only on the second time it is used that SQL Server loads the full execution plan hash into the, into the plan cache. So it saves you a ton of space. And I've done a ton of testing on that as well. And it, I've never seen it hurt performance. And I've often, I should say, almost all the time I see it help performance. So I actually turn that on by default. That's one of my... Uh, preferred default settings for the kind of SQL servers I work with. So what happens if we don't have standards across a team? Well, it's not the end of the world. The worst that will happen is that the next time someone comes along and executes one of these that um, vary from your standard, let me go, just go ahead and run a couple of those. Um, what happens then is you'll see that you have many redundant queries, but as they get called in their own stored procedures and so forth, again, those use counts will go up over time. It's just that now we have five or six versions when if we had been a little bit more careful about it, we have only one, okay? So here's the last one, and I wanna show you this one in a little bit more detail as well. One of the uh, things I, uh, was recently helping one of our customers at Century One with was they had a, a big reporting system, a uh, web-based reporting system, and you would go in and uh, go to the screen and you'd, um, you had an entry field for each of the different things you could sort your queries on. And so you, you know, if it had a location, then find just those locations for the laboratories. But if it was left blank, return all the laboratories. If it had a, um, a state code, then return just that state's values or all of the states if you left it blank. And so it was a massive query with tons of joins and all kinds of um, parameters in the where clause. Remember at the very, very start when, you, when I talked about how SQL Server, the more um, it has to sort through, the more exponentially that the query optimizer has to analyze. And so the old statement, the old axiom if you're a jack of all trades, you're a what? A master of none, right? And so when you write these do all the things SQL statements, it's not gonna ever give you a truly efficient execution plan for any of the individual things you're trying to find. It merely gives you the, probably the least bearable, but bearable query that will run this result set um, effectively. So you, it works, but it doesn't work well. So again, I wanted to show you this in, a, in an example, and I'm actually going to take this one over to Plan Explorer and uh, show you here.
and I'm just going to copy and paste the text here. And I'm going to go ahead and get those execution plans. Oh. And so now we have um, up at the top, you'll see, first of all, we have some highlighting uh, in different colors. So the color coding here, uh, when we see es estimated and actual rows, this is one of those red flags I was telling you about. If the estimated rows differ quite a lot from the actual rows, you know you have poor index statistics. They need to be rebuilt. And in this case, it shows it to you right here. Whereas in Management Studio, it takes a lot of work. Another thing that you would see right off the bat too is we have color coding down here in our plan diagram. So if we wanted to zoom in on this, well, now some other things become apparent. For example, it's got a warning right there on the hash join that it decided to do. And what it's telling us is that it spilled the tempdb and that it was pretty seriously slow. It also had a memory grant problem. So pretty interesting to see each of these different um, variations and how they perform compared one to another. So again, to look at the text here, what we've got is we, let me go back over here to Management Studio actually. So what we have here is a version of the query is, that's the kitchen sink version. So we've got last name, store ID, customer ID, the minimum spend in that stored procedure. And then down here, we have to have um, a where clause to handle each of those different behaviors that we're, we've built parameters around. Okay. The better way to build this is what we call dynamic SQL. And so what you do with dynamic SQL is, and here's the kitchen sink dynamic SQL, is you actually create a very large field uh, parameter to hold the SQL statement that you're going to build on the fly. So here we would say, select all those columns and the base join that we want, and then uh, some people do it this way, some people do it other ways, but um, what I say is where true, where one equals one. That's always going to be a Boolean true, so that means it will always work. So if I execute this query, I know it will always work, and then for each of the different parameters, what I do is if it's not null, simply add, concatenate to the end of it, uh, to that where clause, an and statement with that next um, parameter. And if I don't pass a parameter for last name, it doesn't even put that into the query at all. That way, every time we execute a query, it is optimal. The query doesn't have to evaluate at all for things that we don't care about, okay? So based on those values that we pass in, it will then go ahead and execute each of the, where, uh, the search arguments in the where clause as needed. And then we execute these with a different variety of, um, of these parameters. So again, going over to Plan Explorer, let's uh, scroll down here. So here we have the first execution of the stored procedure. And notice that this version, which is the, um, uh, which is the includes everything kitchen sink version, well, we have some estimation problems. And then the second run that has a percent sign a wild card, it has some estimation problems and it has a very different execution plan. In fact, uh, let's see if I've got, the, uh, I didn't put the duration there. Um, and then again, if we continue on, we can look at the, um, let's look at the dynamic SQL here. All right. All right, now that's a much simpler execution plan, okay? With the wildcard, the dy dy dynamic execution plan. Well, guess what? It doesn't even have those estimator, estimated versus actual role mismatches. So because it doesn't even have to consider those other uh, indexes, like on, um, on uh, the minimal amount and things like that, doesn't even look at them. So now we're dealing with a much smaller result set here. And then finally, um, in the last version. Again, it's a much simpler execution plan. So by flipping that jack of all trades on its head, we now have made our SQL statement because of dynamic SQL, a master of each one of the 
potential variables that it might encounter in that particular situation. Is that new to anyone listening? Hadn't heard that one before? That's the first time I've heard someone explain dynamic SQL where it makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> good like, deal. like, like it's a good time to use dynamic SQL for this. Like usually I'm like, you're just trying to make it complex, but this makes sense. And it's a good way to get around because I do work with a lot of people that try to do everything right for one thing. And so, and, and this way they don't have to write 20 stored procedures. They can still write one stored procedure, but it can do a lot more things without exactly. causing the, I love it. Yeah, and the performance will be not just better for that one individual SQL statement, but every time it's used in each of its different permutations over time, each one of those will perform better. So your entire workload benefits from that. Yeah, it, each individual one is cached as well. So That's right. it's its reuse. That's right. Absolutely so. Um, all right. Now, one last query uh, for everyone. It's a very common question I get when I'm speaking at conferences, and that is, you know, I've got a lot of ways I can uh, write this code. Um, should I use a, a temp, I'm sorry, a table variable. I say temp variable on the slide, sorry about that. Table variable, or should I use a temporary table, you know, hashtag temp table name. Um, I'll, I'll just get straight to the point on that one. Very few cases is the uh, table variable better. Um, at best, it's usually the same, and there are a few cases where it can be worse. Um, the thing about uh, temporary tables is that they are, in a sense, tables, like SQL Server always creates, and so they actually have all of the internals for you to build indexes and such on them. So even if you didn't put a, an explicit index on a temporary table, if it stayed active for a long time, it would start to collect statistics on the various search arguments in that table. On the other hand, table variables don't have that kind of infrastructure. Uh, the M Microsoft dev team calls it scaffolding. They don't have this stuff built around it to support that kind of behavior. So the optimizer actually, in older versions of SQL Server, it actually always said the cardinality estimate for a table variable is one record. And they got 100 times better around SQL Server, I think it was 2014, where they said, um, we're going to estimate cardinality cardinality estimate of 100 records. So um, what that means is table variables are pretty good unless they're actually handling like 10,000 records or 20,000 records. Once it gets over a few thousand, the cardinality estimates are so far off base that they really will be very likely to st slow down the performance of your queries compared to if you used a table, um, a temporary table. The other thing I've heard people say, and I want to point this out, is that, oh, well, I prefer to use CTEs for many circumstances where I would have used a temp table in the past. And that's okay, but please do keep in mind that CTEs, common table expressions, never give you better performance. I kid you not. You could, uh, I've done a ton of testing, and in almost all workloads, they don't improve performance. And in some cases, they can actually make performance worse. The real value of CTEs is that they make your queries more logical and easy to read. So that's the real value. Um, and that's a very serious and significant value, so I'm not downplaying that. But don't think of those as a performance improver because they actually don't improve performance. All right, one last uh, quick question uh, I wanna throw out there. Um, so, We've got a database, we've got our DBO schema, and there is a stored procedure in there, SP test. By the way, don't ever use SP underscore test when you write your own stored procedures. Uh, that will cause lots of problems. So we've got one called SP test, and it's only got one executable line in there. It says select star from the table named test. However, there is in that same database a table named test, and um, there is a table that is owned by Sheldon and the Sheldon schema, okay? So Sheldon comes along and he executes SP test. Whose data is gonna get used? He's got his own schema 
And there's also a DBO schema there. And each one have a table named test. A lot of people are kind of surprised to discover that it's the, the ownership, the schema owner of the stored procedure that that's the data it gets used, not the user that executes that code. And so uh, part of the reason I bring this up is that more and more of us are, are going to the cloud. And so, yes, it's true that Microsoft recommends that we always use this two-part naming convention in our code. That's part of their standards recommendations. But it's even more important if you decide to use something like Azure SQL Database, because it's not multiple databases, one of the ways you can get logical separation and get database-like uh, kind of separation between sets of data and tables and stuff is to use schemas. So if you're not really clear on how schemas uh, behave, then you can have some real shenanigans happen in terms of your SQL Server query behavior. Keep that in mind. All right. So we're all out of time, and I really apologize that I've gone way over on, on time. Um, just a recap here of the different um, lessons that I was teaching throughout. Also, um, while I'm uh, reviewing this, a couple calls to action for you. One is, it, I believe I already have the slides and the scripts posted at century1.com slash kcline. So if you want the slides and the scripts that I showed, you can download them right now. If you want to watch a recorded version of this video, it's at century1.com slash webinar videos. And of course, I, I really want you to connect with me on Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn, and I want you to download Plan Explorer if you don't already have it. Uh, but after, um, you know, after those kind of wrap up calls to action, um, what other questions do you have, Andrea? Do you want me to uh, answer anything in a, in a queue, yeah, perhaps? Let's, let's see if there's, a, it, this is a great time for you to ask questions. I, I don't think you should apologize for going over because that was amazing. Oh, <laughs> well, <thank you. laughs> I learned so much on that. You said I wouldn't learn anything. I learned so much and I'm, wow. I'm like, there's all these things I'm going to change now. Um, <laughs> but if people have questions, I think it would be great. So um, Jake did ask about um, what was the ad hoc feature called? And I think it's the optimize, is it optimize or optimize for ad hoc workload? Optimize for ad hoc workload. Okay. And, and it's a server level setting, right? Yes, that's right. Perfect. Yes. Okay, so I answered it right. I've... Yes. <laughs> um, while we wait for questions, how many folks do we still have online with us? Uh, we still have 30 people. Okay, cool. So we've, we've had a good chunk stick around. Um, at our high point, we were at 45, but we, you know, the, yeah, yeah. So we had a good turnout. Um, <laughs> Greg is asking, will you submit this session to our upcoming SQL Saturday in August? If you want me to, I will. I think I actually originally had um, uh, planned a full day pre-con that included this content and a lot of other content. Um, you know, a full day session on query tuning and how the optimizer works and things like that. Uh, but we've had to, you know, with the virtual world, we've had to um, change plans. Mm -hmm. But uh, I have this in one hour, three hour, seven hour, and then two day formats. Wow. Um, so um, if you send me an email, uh, kcline at century1.com, I'll send you some of that longer form content if uh, you're interested and want to learn more, uh, you know, really start to study SQL Server. And then I'll um, work proactively with the Salt Lake City SQL Saturday team to see exactly what they might like me to present and, uh, and then we can, uh, we can certainly uh, make sure that we cover this and or some other stuff. Yeah, this, this was good. And in fact, Greg's like, this would be an amazing pre-con and I, I totally agree. Um, Patrick, yes, this session was recorded. Um, I, I know that Pat is going to have control of the session, so, um, but it sounds like Kevin also has one up on, on the Century One site as well, a, right. a version of this one. So, um, and then, um, I jumped forward. Chad says he's been using fast forward, but not local. So that was awesome to learn. So you even taught Chad something, which is amazing. He's brilliant. <laughs> um, back on slide six, you mentioned functions won't use indexes in the select statement. Does that include user created functions? Yes, it does. And it's, it's kind of, it's not quite correct to say it won't use them. Um, 
it can use the index, but the best it can do on the index is a scan. So um, that means it'll have to read all of the values in that, let's say it's a one column index. So it's not like it has to do a full table scan and read all the columns of the table in every row. It, it, uh, you'll see that it'll switch many times from a uh, index seek to an index scan, and then it'll have to read all the, the rows in there. So, uh, but that's still pretty bad. You know, when you expect that indexed column to have a, um, uh, you know, be taking advantage of that index, then, and it, it basically doesn't, that can be uh, pretty alarming. What would you recommend for it? And this, sorry, this is me. What would uh -huh. you recommend in place of like an is null and like set it equal to a certain date or something like that, wrapping around a date? How would you get around that so that you could take off the function piece? Yeah, if, if possible, what you would want to do is, um, if possible, what you would want to do, like in a stored procedure, is you, you could say, um, you know, declare the different parameters that you're passing in. And if it's left blank, give it a default value. Um, and so that way, when you, you know that it will never be null. So when you get down to the comparison in the where clause, you don't have to check if it's null or not. It always has the default value. Um, that's one way to handle it. Uh, another way to um, handle it is to, if you can take the function off of the search argument. So uh, again, I should probably put this into the script. If you say where higher date equals parameter and you've got is null around higher date, well, what if there's something you can move over to the parameter, for, uh, for example? Um, so that's why I suggest doing it with the declare. Um, but sometimes you can actually just shift your function from the column that is in the where clause over to the comparison, whatever it's comparing it to, oh, okay. and apply your, uh, your function over there, and that won't, that won't mess it up. Nice. OK. Thank you. Um, all right, we have another one. Uh, when do you recommend to strictly use CTEs over temp tables other than readability? Um, there's certain logical operations that I really like to do with CTEs. So um, uh, it's a little bit more of an advanced um, feature and I, uh, I didn't actually cover it in this session. It's probably, it'd probably be in my next 10 things that I would want people to, to learn for their SQL code. Um, okay. Have you ever heard of something called a numbers table? I have, yes. Yeah, so uh, many DBAs and dev teams will make sure that one of their databases, maybe the production database or maybe say MSDB, has a table called a numbers table and so that way, uh, let's say, for example, I wanted to, and this is a recent example, I had a, a database kind of like um, MSDB for jobs, you know, it was a, a job execution database and scheduling system. And so what I wanted to do was to build a histogram of how many jobs happen per hour. Oh. Uh, and so rather than write, you know, 12 queries looking at each hour and or 24 and using a union or something like that, or uh, maybe uh, uh, resolving result sets into temp tables. What I had was a CTE that did the, um, that referenced the join to the numbers table and it would join against that numbers table for each of the 24 hours around the clock. And so with one query, I could easily get 24 different result sets for each hour of the day to see how many jobs fired in each of those hours. Because you're uh, taking advantage of the fact that the CTE has to run every single time. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So um, there's a really, really good blog post about it uh, at SQLPerformance.com. And it's written by um, Aaron Bertrand and um, really smart guy. And so I, I encourage you to take a little time to read that uh, and, and, you know, um, kind of make that one of, the, one of the tools in your toolkit. Awesome. And in, in fact, if you're curious, I'll also show you where CTEs are bad. Um, so give me just a second to pull open that particular SQL statement. See if I'm in the right um, 
folder here. Uh, just out of curiosity, um, who is uh, Andrew? Uh, while I'm counting down here uh, to find my query, could you figure out who's 13th on the list? And that will be the first winner uh, of the ebook. All right, let's see. See, I think I have it right here. Jake Roberts. All right, Jake. So I pulled up my uh, the D and D dice functionality out of um, Google. Uh, Roll thirteen. So it, what I'd like to ask of you is if you could um, send me an email, kclient at century one dot com. And I will make sure you um, you get that ebook, which is about forty five fifty dollar of value, there. And Jake's presenting to us next month. So. Oh yeah, okay, cool. All right, come on here. So don't forget to send the email, Jake. All right. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna kill that and see if we can do a little bit better than that. Let's see here. Um, hmm. And again, I apologize. I should have queued this up ahead of time. I think it'll be here in one of my seminars. You are great. I have a cursor question while you're looking for it. Do you want the yes. cursor question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, please. Um, would a perfectly written cursor loop be worse than a garden variety while loop, better or the same? Um, I put my emphasis in the wrong syllables on there. <laughs> so um, would a regular cursor be better than a while loop? Would a perfectly written cursor loop be oh. worse than a garden variety while loop, better or the same? Probably be a little bit better, actually. Um, I'm not positive of that, but at one time, it was quite a while ago, but at one time I did actually do some testing on that and it seemed like it, um, uh, it seemed like it did perform better. Uh, again, okay. you have to deallocate at the end of that, but um, uh, so it does use a little bit more resources, but it's not um, it's, it's not as bad as what you might otherwise have with a, um, uh, uh, the while loop there. Gotcha. Okay, so here's, here's the um, interesting lesson learned about CTEs. So here I've got a CTE statement it, and what it's basically doing is it's already kind of pre-filtering the territories out for a particular query. So when I execute this, I get, I'm going to get a, a pretty nice um, execution plan. I've got a clustered index seek. So it's just going straight to the records it needs on the, um, on the base table. And then it returns my result set to me. The weird thing about CTEs and the pro uh, uh, where they can be a problem is if you reference them more than once. SQL Server for some reason is not smart enough to know that it's already materialized the result set and loaded it into the cache. So if I have more than one reference to it in my where clause, it will actually rerun basically that query. You know, think of it as ad hoc view. So now I've, um, I've got the same CTE at the start, but now I'm referencing it in, uh, in two places in this query. So now look what happens when we get to the execution plan. It's double the size. We now have two result sets, even though their source is that single CTE. And then again, we've got C1 here, and we're just gonna reference it a couple of times for some other reasons, uh, maybe in a where clause, maybe in a join. And now when we look at that execution plan, wow, uh, it's doubled again. So this is the danger of CTEs. If you're very consistent and you only, you know, you declare it and then you use it, uh, then keep doing that if that's comfortable for you. But if you actually reference them multiple times, then you're probably hurting your performance there. 
Awesome. All right. Was whoops. Oh, I think that was all the questions. Uh, all right, let's roll the dice one more time. And because there's 30 people, I'm going to do a plus 10 here. Let's see what we get. All right. Number 15. Oh, number 15. Okay. Mm -hmm. I have to scroll. Mark Hardaway. Mark. Still with us, Mark? He is. Okay, good. You must be present to win. Yes. I'm only <laughs> I'm only looking at people that are present right now. Excellent. So yes. So same deal. You need to have Mark email you, right? That's right. That's right. Uh-huh. And it's kcline at century1.com. Correct. All right, Mark, thank you. He says he Thank can you. do, so. <laughs> All right, fantastic. <laughs> Thank you so much. This has Thank been you. amazing. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. Okay. Um,